there is exactly one game of tic-tac-toe? Look, you're probably watching this because you saw my recent video about there being 14 games of tic-tac-toe, and, well, I have some corrections to make. Oh, and I have some fancy new diagrams complete with sonification, so stick around for that. Actually, let's start with one of these fancy new diagrams. See, if you number the positions in tic-tac-toe from 1 to 9, you can represent a game of tic-tac-toe in a little graph where the x-axis represents which move you're on, and the y-axis represents where the player plays. For example, here's one of the 14 games of tic-tac-toe from the previous video. So to recap real quick, the way that I got it down to 14 games of tic-tac-toe in the last video was by starting with the 362,880 possible orders in which to play the squares, then paring that down to 255,168 by cutting off games someone has won. We then filter it down to 31,896 based on the fact that many of these games are symmetrical copies of one another. I did this with some complicated Python code, but a few people pointed out in the comments that since there are eight different possible reflections and rotations of the board, I could have found this number with a somewhat simpler Python script. Anyway, these first steps of filtering were purely mechanical, and I think pretty uncontroversial. But from here on, I started filtering based on strategy. The first step was to assume that players take winning moves when they appear. Next, we assume that players block the winning moves of the other player. Then we assume that players try to get two in a row if they can, that they take the opportunity to fork if it presents itself, and then we get it down to 64 games by considering a game to be over the moment a fork takes place. Finally, in a highly questionable step that I already pointed out was a little bogus, we assume that the first player plays in the middle square. Now, I think different people might draw the line at different places in this progression. Personally, I think it's pretty uncontroversial to assume that players will play winning moves and block the other players' winning moves. But it was the next assumption that really got some of you up in arms in the comments. Remember this? In the original video, I argued that a competent player would never make one of these moves, but instead would make one of these moves so as to set up three in a row in the following turn. Well, I'm sorry to say that Drake misled you. It turns out that there are some situations where it might make sense to play a move that doesn't immediately set you up for three in a row, because it might set you up for a fork on a future turn. In fact, countless comments mentioned this one situation in which X starts in the corner and O responds with the center. Now, Drake would have us play in one of these four locations, but many of you felt that the best move is actually the opposite corner. Why? Well, because of the symmetry of the board, there are really only two responses that O can make here the edge or the corner. And if O falls into the trap of playing in one of the attractive looking corner spots, they're toast, because X can play in the opposite corner and create a fork. Anyway, all of this strategizing does make you wonder, what exactly is the optimal play in tic-tac-toe? Is there such a thing as a perfect player? Well, it turns out that tic-tac-toe is what's known as a solved game. The state of possible games is small enough that we can actually consider every possible ramification of every possible move, and in that sense, play perfectly. Perhaps you've seen one of these confusing looking diagrams showing the optimal play for each player. I first encountered this kind of diagram as an XKCD cartoon, although this particular one came from Wikipedia. And I think this diagram was created using something called a minimax algorithm. Without going into too much detail, the minimax algorithm basically backtracks from the end of the game to figure out the projected value of different moves. So let's say that a win for X is a score of 10, a win for O is a score of negative 10, and a tie is a score of zero. X is trying to maximize the projected score, and O is trying to minimize that score. In a game as simple as tic-tac-toe, both players can consider every possible ramification of every move, and select the one that leads to the best score. Here's the thing though, what's deceptive about these optimal play diagrams is that they make it sound like there's only one optimal path, one perfect choice for every move. But actually, there are often several equally optimal moves in a given situation. For instance, consider this situation where it's X's turn to play. If X goes in the center, they create a fork and win. If they go in the lower left corner, they also create a fork and win. If X goes in the middle top, O will go in the center, create a fork and win. If X goes in either of the remaining spots, a draw is inevitable. A minimax algorithm therefore assigns these scores to the different choices. The optimal play is either center or corner, but neither is inherently better. There isn't one right move. Anyway, I built a minimax tic-tac-toe player for this video, and it actually turns out that, assuming two players with perfect skill, perfect visions into the future ramifications of any move, there are 336 different games of tic-tac-toe, and they are all draws. In particular, with perfect players, it actually doesn't matter what X's first move is. Center, corner, edge. Against a perfect player, there's no way to force a win, and you can always ensure a draw. 
Now, you might have noticed a crucial caveat there. We are assuming two players with perfect skill, and I have more to say about that. But first, let's make some cool diagrams. See, there's a problem with the first diagram I showed you, which is that all it shows is the square someone played on a given move, but it doesn't really show you the state of the board. Like, look at these two games. The diagram makes it look like they intersect and branch off, but actually they're totally different games. The only similarity is that X plays in the lower right corner on the fifth move. To really understand all the branching possibilities of a tic-tac-toe game, we need to change our y-axis to represent the state of the whole board. And once again, we'll take advantage of symmetry to reduce the number of states. So to be concrete about it, at the beginning there is one possible state of the board, empty. After X's first move, there are three possible states of the board depending on whether they play corner, edge, or center. All other possible states are just symmetrical copies. After O plays the second move, there are now 12 possible states of the board. And then on X's next move, there are 38 possible states of the board. Remember, at each stage I'm lumping together symmetric versions of the same board state. And interestingly, although the number of states of the board goes up a lot at first, it reduces towards the end as the board fills up. So if we go back to those two games we were just looking at and plot them using board state on the y-axis, we can now see that the games are completely different from one another. On the other hand, we can see that these two games, which feature a completely different sequence of moves, share a common state on the fifth move. Going back to our perfect players, we can now visualize the whole web of tie games in a really satisfying way. Let's take a listen to a few of them. Cool, huh? Let's get back to strategy. So far we've talked about the concept of perfect strategy, and I mentioned that there's this assumption that you're playing a perfect player against another perfect player. But the thing is, the reason so many people like the corner-center-corner corner opening is that in reality, we don't play against perfect opponents. Against a perfect opponent, it's just one way of reaching the inevitable draw. Against an imperfect opponent though, there's a decent chance that they'll fall into the trap of playing one of the remaining corners. So in trying to count the possible tic-tac-toe games, how can we account for both the simple heuristic play from my previous video, in which players just try to get two in a row when they can, and the more calculated forward-thinking play of an ideal player? Well, simple. We just allow both styles of play. And if we do that, we end up with 398 different games of tic-tac-toe, which we can represent in this beautiful decision tree. I've colored the final states where X wins in orange, the final states where O wins in green, and the tie games in gray. So is that it? Are there 398 games of tic-tac-toe? Did I deceptively name this video for clickbait? Well, maybe a little, but here's the thing. Looking at this diagram, there are many cases where, having reached a certain move, the outcome is now predetermined. From here, for instance, there are several different ways in which we can get to a draw, but unless someone fails to block an obviously winning move, it's going to be a draw. Similarly, from here, unless X chooses a really stupid move, there's no way for them to lose. So I think it's actually pretty reasonable to prune back this tree and end the games when the outcome is inevitable. And when you do that, you arrive back at the much more modest number of 113 different games. To me, this is the space of possible games that you truly might arrive at in real-world tic-tac-toe combat. And check it out, here's the corner-center-corner corner opening we keep talking about, and it has two possible next moves. The corner, which leads inevitably to X winning, or the edge, which leads inevitably to a draw. Oh, and by the way, we can go back to the diagram representing perfect players and do the same thing. It turns out that with perfect players, the one true game of tic-tac-toe is to sit down, look each other in the eyes, shake hands, and call it a draw. See, it wasn't clickbait. By the way, a couple of loose ends I want to address. First, the code. Some people requested to look at my code for the last video, and it was a bit of a mess, but I cleaned it up for this video, so see the description for the link. Second, based on my research for this video, I'm no longer 100% convinced that the corner is objectively the best first move. I think generally the evidence people give for this comes from those optimal move diagrams, but these diagrams just give the first available optimal move. I am convinced that the corner-center-corner corner sequence is a pretty shrewd opening strategy for X. But is it the only strategy like this? Have any of you found other clever strategies that trick your opponents into making a mistake? Next, some people pointed out in my last video that all of the tie games look the same. 
It turns out that our fancy new diagram can clarify this a little. If we load those 14 games, we can see that all the tie games end up at the same board state, even though they took different paths. If we widen this out to the larger set of games that we considered in this video, there are actually three different tied boards that you can arrive at. That said, as this video shows, I clearly did make some mistakes, or at least oversights, in that first video. And you know, that's the thing about making YouTube videos. Once in a while, a video blows up and gets hundreds of thousands, or in this case, millions of views. But most of the time, they don't. My natural inclination is always to track down every last detail, make a video perfect. But sometimes that's led me to put months of work into videos that just don't get picked up by the algorithm for whatever reason. So anyway, if you want to support my natural instinct to go a little bananas with the analysis, visuals, and sonifications, consider subscribing to my Patreon. There's some pretty fun bonus material there too, and for this video I'm planning to do a live walkthrough of my code, if that's something that interests you. Finally, it's come to my attention that some people left the last video with the impression that I don't have a lot of respect for tic-tac-toe. Tic-tac-toe is a f***ing stupid game. Funnily enough, the whole idea for these videos actually came from teaching my three-year-old son to play tic-tac-toe. He loved it, and because he loved it, I love it too. It's clearly a game that has persisted for a reason, because it represents a kind of sweet spot in terms of complexity. And paradoxically, it's this perfect level of complexity that has allowed the kind of analysis I've been doing here. And also, as several commenters pointed out, its simplicity makes it an amazing tool for teaching the cognitive and social aspects of competitive gameplay. So, I take back my flip comment. It's not a stupid game. It's still hella unfair, though. Worm, 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 worm,